All right, so thank you, everyone. My name is Hayford Mensa Ayrakwa. So Ayrakwa is a surname, that's why it's here. Uh, I'm with the University of Ghana, and more recently with Lund University in Sweden, doing my PhD. Uh, I have been working with a, a unit of the university called Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research, ISA, uh, which uh, primary goal is to do a lot of uh, social economic related research to influence policy, both in Ghana and Africa and uh, I've been privileged to be part of this uh, cash transfer evaluation and so I present to you an aspect of uh, a broader uh, evaluation that we did uh, last year and uh, which we ended this year and so all right so as we can see the topic I'm looking at impact of cash transfer house impact of cash transfers and uh, on, on household consumption expenditures the Ghana government started this cash transfer program in 2008 as a pilot program and the whole objective was to help extremely poor households. Of course we have this uh, GLSS5 uh, which is Ghana Living Standards Survey which is done uh, over time and the fifth one of course classifies some group of people as extremely poor. Uh, that, so the target of this program is looking at extremely poor, bottom 20% of the extremely poor households. And so to do this, at the same time when we're thinking about this program, uh, the Yale University, in collaboration with the University of Ghana, specifically my unit, were considering a panel uh, survey. And so we decided to build this into the whole program to allow for the evaluation process. And to be enrolled or to get part of this program, what the uh, condition were was to first of all, there were a whole lot of conditions, but the target was to target people who were extremely uh, disadvantaged, for example, people with severe disabilities and have had no working capability, people, uh, children, OVCs. We also had in mind the aged with no productive capacity, among several other. Uh, uh, conditions. The objective for getting these people into the cash transfer program was to help them, you know, in the short run to uh, smoothen their consumption. But of course, in the long run, we were looking at the opportunity for them building human capital that would enable them to, be, to uh, effectively take part in their uh, day to day activities in the economy. Now, how did we go about this whole thing? I already mentioned that we did this at the same time when Yale and ISA were trying to do, start their panel data. And so a pilot started in 2008 and uh, originally we had sampled 700 uh, beneficiaries in some districts across the country. And so these districts were kept as our treated uh, community. And after the baseline, we of course rolled out the program for them. And at the same time, Yale also took their baseline in the same year. And so in 2012, when we have to go back to the same, to do our evaluation, we had to do a matching of the people in the Yale sample that matched our sample uh, in the LEAP communities so that we are able to get a, equally a balanced uh, sample to be able to do any useful assessment, impact assessment. Now what happened, the interesting thing we found was that, you know, at the time of uh, follow-up, we realized that some of the households that we had earmarked as, as a control because of their condition. Of course, this is uh, politically also, you know, in our part of the world, in my country, uh, your, your, your sustainability in office depends on what people are seeing. And so sometimes governments want to uh, also roll out things quickly to uh, let people know that we are about do, we are making some impact. And so some of the control groups had been rolled up onto the leap or had been scaled up onto the leap. So in our analysis, we try to regroup them as just so that we don't bias our work. Of course, uh, with the panel data of the sort, we, the, the literature gives a clear direction of what to do. And the DID has featured prominently, uh, the difference in difference analysis has featured prominently in analysis of this nature. And so that is what we adopted to look at that. Now, this is uh, just an, uh, some extracts from the results and some summary of the key findings that I want to show to you. Uh, 
the consumption, of course, which is the objective of the program, to smoothen consumption. So the question is, is it really helping improve in the consumption? And of course, if it's improving consumption, what are the sort of things that the people are consuming? Is it starchy base? Is it so my point was whether or not we have a more balanced meal at the household level than it used to be in the past. And so I try to uh, disaggregate consumption into different components. And now you have your cereals, nuts, bread, fats and oil, spices, protein, fruits, uh, staples, uh, confectionery, beverages, restaurant, among other things. And pretty interesting. Of course, we see, especially with regards to protein, a uh, sharp something here. But uh, a test of uh, means uh, showed that there is no significant difference between the treatment and control group at the baseline. So this is at the baseline, just to show that the people we are trying to look at, of course, are match they, they are comparable in the first place so this basically gives us that assurance that things are okay now when we apply the the model the difference in difference application we realize that overall the beneficiary households seem to have had a sharp reduction in the expenditure regards to consumption and it was really striking because we're expecting otherwise and uh, I'll tell you soon why uh, this happened. We also realized that there was no impact on protein-related foods, fats, and most of the indicators that we thought that once we are getting some uh, assistance, we expect an improvement in some of these indicators. Rather, we're not finding any significant thing there. Again, for me, it was striking. What is happening? And observed a negative impact on expenditures on cereals, beverages, and spices. So the results really don't look too good from the researcher point of view and of course even for policy point of view. However, something interesting, what we tried to find out was whether or not prior to the program were beneficiary households depending on say own produce for their consumption or they were relying on remittances from other people for consumption or after the initiative, uh, are they now depending a lot more on purchases than, you know, and we live in a, the, the cultural setting is such that once everybody knows that you are really poor, society or other households tend to have some, uh, uh, some concern for you and would want to extend a helping hand when the need arises. But immediately you are mapped and said that you are part of this initiative, obviously people step back. And so... We, we, we realized that some of these things were interplaying. And so we saw that now there was a bit more a switch from own produce, which used to be the case at the time of rolling onto the program, to consumption that was now dependent on, you know, purchases. Now, what we realized to be driving this result, as I conclude, is that for most of these beneficiary households, as I mentioned earlier, the benefits or the re the remittances were not coming and other people were not helping but unfortunately the transfers were not coming regularly as they should have come for example in a situation for example in 2011 2012 up to about eight months beneficiary households had not received their uh, subventions and of course you don't expect them to consume if they cannot get the money to consume and also their social protection assistance that we are getting from community and family relations had also gone away so again this is what we so the major recommendation out of this work i seem to be projecting is that transfers to beneficiary households should be consistent to smoothing consumption as the program objective wants to do. Thank you.